Well, listen, I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited about this. Not that I'm going to stay because I have other things to do. But I think, I think colloquia are, are such an important way uh, for departments not only to continue to bond, but also, also to uh, uh, another way to explore ideas that are out there, developments that are happening in the field, uh, and to really have a chance uh, to interact with professionals who aren't in, in your department. This is one of, the colloquium is one of the uh, premier intellectual exercises at colleges and universities. I know what I'm saying to many of you, you already know, I just want to validate this and affirm this. Uh, and I, I think, uh, who, who developed this, Natalia? Three people, Natalia. Uh, who are the other two? Can't remember the other two? Nicolia Machini. Okay, very good. So I commend the three of you. This is good. Relatively young faculty members, except for Tabacoli, who is. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Uh, it's a very important thing. It's good for departmental morale, uh, and uh, and also it also gives us an opportunity to showcase who we are to visitors from other universities and other parts of the community. We've got uh, you know, Dr. Yanofsky here uh, from that place, that place out of here, Brooklyn College, I know, <laughs> and the Graduate Center. Uh, I was going to talk about the scientific limits of reason. I wasn't aware there were limits to reason, except when I talked to another human being, and then that's a man <laughs> limits uh, to reason. Uh, but this is going to, I, I'm sure this will be the first of many, uh, and I want to welcome Dr. Yanofsky and uh, all of you have a good time. Don't forget, ask him questions because don't let him get out of here without uh, being challenged, all right? And uh, congratulations to the math department. And I have to, because he'll get upset if I don't say this, I really want to commend Kamal's leadership <laughs> because Kamal has done a great job in hiring the right people, <laughs> which is very important. So let's have a good colloquium. And uh, Dr. Yanofsky, am I introducing? Uh, oh, you, so let me introduce Kamal. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, this has been, uh, we've been working on this for a long time to make this possible. I am really, really delighted to finally have our first mathematics colloquium in the department. As you may recall, we started an engineering colloquium in fall semester. And of course, uh, being competitive in this epoch, the math people decided, hey, we can do that too. But to be honest with you, the main reason why we have this is because, as you know, LaGuardia and other community colleges are really stressing scholarship. We've been hiring faculty who are highly qualified. We have about 40, 42 faculty members in the department. Most of the faculty have PhDs, and most of the faculty are doing research in their field. So clearly, and all of them, a lot of them are doing research in fields that are very diverse, different from each other. And we thought that this might be the right medium for faculty to share their research and talk about what's going on in their field. And I have to really thank um, the three faculty members who took the lead in this project to make it possible. They did it very quickly. I mean, we had it in as part of our math department goals which is now the MEC Department of Goals, Math, Engineering, and Computer Science, that we create a math colloquium in the department. Natalia has done a fantastic job in putting this together, as well as his colleagues, Tabakoli and Majidi Zolzanin. I have to say that the process was very quick and fast. And we are delighted that today the first speaker is actually from a CUNY college our you know, brother college, or sister college, whichever one you want to call it. Brooklyn College, of course, and the graduate center, Nosen Yanovsky. And Nosen happens to actually uh, know a couple of faculty in our department. In fact, one of the faculty members in our department, Jerry Yanni, was uh, a school, graduate schoolmate of his at the graduate center. Unfortunately, he can't be here today. But uh, he sends his uh, apologies. And, uh, and uh, we really want to thank you for taking your time to come and talk to us about the scientific limits of reason. Even though there might not be any limits to reason, there might be some scientific limits to it. And we'd like to hear that today. So welcome. So first of all, thank you for inviting me.
having me, and uh, thank you for, uh, this is a very nice thing, and it's, 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 it should be nice, so I, I also want to thank Natalia. Natalia was a student of mine at Brooklyn College, and she remains the uh, the best student I ever had at Brooklyn College, it was, it was a pleasure. I didn't say one of the best, I said the best. You know, and, and, that's why, and that's why we hired her. <laughs> that's what she told us, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, thank you very much. Um, so, the talk is, a, is, it comes out of actually from teaching. Okay, so I'm teaching this core class, and this core class is called Paradoxes and the Limits of Knowledge. And we talk about different things, which I'll show you in a minute, and there wasn't a, there wasn't a book that had it. And so what I've been doing is I've been writing this book about this and handing out my notes, and there's nothing like handing out notes to students and they give you the corrections and they, and they giggle at your spelling mistakes and they laugh at you and whatever, and you, you come out really with a perfect manuscript after that. So, so I've, been, I've been doing this, um, and, um, and I, you know, it's, it's almost there. And I'm just going to pass, you know, two of these around while I'm talking. And this is something I've been, I've been working on. And uh, it's about the limits of reason. So let, let's, 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 let's get into it. So, oh, sorry, I got a point there. Okay. This is like a, an abstract. Over the past century or so, scientists, mathematicians, especially logicians, and other researchers have turned their focus inwards and found limitations of their own disciplines. In other words, what they cannot do. There are limitations of science, pre, uh, of science predictability, in other words, for what they can predict, limitations to our intuitions, and limitations to reason itself. We shall examine a few examples of such limitations and show why they have made these disciplines far more interesting. In other words, things get more interesting because there are, you know, ends of what you can do. Our talk will touch upon diverse areas of complexity theory, relativity theory, chaos theory, Galois theory, and girls, girls theory. Um, okay, so just to, to motivate the talk, and, and, and I give this class to Brooklyn College students who are not computer majors, not math majors, um, and I try to, uh, to push this. So we all le love to learn new things, but what we know, once you know something, you're bored by it, okay? And we're intrigued by what we don't know. But more of that, what we cannot know interests us even more. I mean, things that we cannot know, that's what we're really interested in. Um, yeah, by the way, this is the natural progression of AP. Experienced person now, let's just get to the board. And then you went in. It's just not interesting. Um, uh, now, limitations of knowledge is not something new. Philosophers have been talking about such things for, for, for millennia. So, but. In some sense, we can say, oh, that's just philosophy or something like that. But the stuff I'm going to talk about here is really scientific stuff and um, showing that there are limitations. Uh, as of late science, math, reason, math, reason logic has shown that there are limits to what they can tell us. And there are certain things that cannot be done by reason, and they are beyond the outer limits of reason. So the, name, the title of that book is The Outer Limits of Reason. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. And again, it's about limitations, but it's also um, Know, what's, what, what's, what's out there. Okay. Many of them have similar causes for be, being beyond the limits of reason. Our goal is to learn the structure of reason. So I want to see what exactly is the structure. And we're going to see a lot of things are self-referential and stuff like that. Um, and that causes uh, limitations. Okay. This is not an anti-science talk. This is not a spacey, wishy-washy you know, types of things like, oh, this is beyond us or things like that. This is, Whatever I'm saying is done by really serious things. We are praising science as the only human creation that can see its own limits. So it's actually a good thing to see your own limits, to see what you can do and what you can't do. Um, we are stressing the kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but not, this is not from the, the, we're not talking about epistemology, but more from the science point of view. And we're going to go through five different examples. Now I promise you, every one of the, every one of you knows the sum of this, and and that's fine. I'm not. Um, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is show that there's a whole, f there's a, you know, a lot of interesting stuff. There's a whole field of this of limitations of what we can know. Okay. So we're going to go through as follows. We're going to talk about some things that computers can't do in a reasonable amount of time. We're going to talk about some things about chaos theory, relativity theory, which is more on the physics side. Then we'll talk about mathematics, a little bit about Galois theory, and then finally Gödel's theorem, which says literally there are certain things that are true, but they can't be proven. Okay, which is which is a nice result. In other words, there are things that are true, but it is a limitation of human ability to prove. Okay. So 
hard computer problems. Okay, this is this is a classic, nice example of something uh, Goose is called the traveling salesman problem. And it goes as follows. The traveling salesman wants to visit a number of cities and find the shortest path that hits these cities exactly once. He wants to go to six different cities and he wants to hit these cities exactly. He wants to hit every city exactly once. So here's a nice graph that shows the relationship between these two, between these six cities, how far each one is. And he wants to go to every one of these cities exactly once and come back to them, but he wants to do it at the cheapest price, or the cheapest, the shortest, the shortest distance. Okay? So he can go here, 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 here. And this is, by the way, this is this is very typical. Okay? This is you know not a strange thing. But the question is, how do you find the shortest way? By the way, you type in Expedia and you want to go to six places, you might be able to do this. Um, so you, you want to go to six places. Notice that this, this, this graph is not, you know, when we're here, I have New York on this side and I have Denver on this side. But again, I'm just showing you the distances. Okay, well, how do you do? How do you, how do you figure it out? Well, one way to figure it out is as follows. Try all possibilities. Okay? Simply try all possibilities. Question, how many different possibilities are there? So, you have six cities that you could choose for your first, times five cities that you could choose for your second city, times four times three times two times one. So, you have six factorial. Okay. There are, for six cities, you need to check six factorial, which is 720 pence. So, you can go through a computer, you can go, you have 720 possibilities, and you're looking for the shortest possibility, perfectly normal. And a computer can do it in seconds flat. Literally, not a second flat, half a second. Okay, 720 possibilities, no problem with this. Question, how about for n cities? If I had more than six cities, but I had n cities, how long would it take? Okay, so you have to check n factorial possibilities. n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So you just have to go, go through all those possibilities. And again, each path, you can add them all up, add up the path, see how much your time takes, then look for the smallest one. You keep on going, you keep on going through all 700 possibilities. Okay, what about n is equal to 100? And by the way, this is not a crazy thing. You're a traveling salesman, you want to go through, you want to do a major trip through every major city in America with more than 100,000 people. Let's say there's 100 cities in the city, you want to do it. It would take 100 factorial, and you have to go through 100 factorial possible paths and find the shortest. Question, how long will this take? And this is an open, open, seriously, how long will it take to do 100 factorial paths? Now, it depends on how fast your computer is, but are there any guesses? One second. One second. A millisecond. A millisecond. A millisecond. Anybody else? A millisecond. Greater than the age of the universe. Close. Any, anybody else? Okay. Now, the, the first thing is it depends how fast your computer is. So assume that your computer can check a million paths in a second. How long do you think it'll take? So we said 720 will take it. If you can do a million in a second, 720 is pittance. So it's very little. But how much? Well, let's do it. Okay, 100 factorial is that. Okay, but we could do a million in a second. So then we have 100 factorial divided by a million. So that's that. <laughs> whoops, 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 whoops. Sorry, sorry. Oh. Okay, that many minutes. That many hours, dividing by 60 gives you that many hours, that many days, that many years, okay, that many centuries. Okay, so in scientific notation, 2.9 times 10 to the 142 centuries. Okay, that's a lot, a lot, a lot more than the age of the universe or anything else. Okay, and a lot more than a couple of seconds. By the way, usually I get answers like a couple of weeks. But, but, but anyways, um, that's a lot. Okay? Now, again, a computer can solve it. It's a solvable problem. You simply go through all possibilities. It's not something strange thing that a computer can, you know, a computer can solve it. It is doable. I can write a program for it in 10 minutes. Okay, you can write a program for it in 10 minutes. Just go through all possibilities, whatever. However, there's no way in the world you're going to get to 2.9 times 10 to the point of 
Okay, so this is an essential, a limitation of our ability to know. And by the way, it's a legitimate question. Take the top 